everyone. Um, thank you for that introduction, Molly. And thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to be here. I've just graduated from Cambridge. I kind of feel like I'm in enemy territory. <laughs> but, um, thank you so much for having me. And um, I think you gave a bit of an introduction, but just to talk about who I am. My name's Amica George. And I started a campaign called Free Periods back in 2017, um, which was eventually responsible for convincing the government to provide free period products in all schools and colleges in England. Um, I started it after reading about girls who can afford period products um, and often were missing up to a week of school every month just because of lack of access. And I'm really fortunate that I've personally never experienced that, but it really horrified me and I think angered me. And what made me feel even more angry is that despite really huge uh, public and media attention, there just wasn't the same level of response from the government. And I think right now, looking at our current government and the state of this country, I think that that same feeling really resonates with a lot of people of expecting something that feels quite um, decent or kind of a given and not seeing what feels like the more human political response from the people who actually have that power to enact changes that we want to see. And to me, that's where activism comes in. Um, my journey with activism was, you know, it was long and it was difficult. It was the cam campaign kind of morphed from an online petition on change.org into a real life protest back in December of 2017, um, where over 2,000 people came and stood outside Downing Street and shouted about tampons and wore red, and it was really fun. Um, and then that didn't really work. And then it became a legal campaign where we started working with a group of human rights lawyers to say that the government were actually, um, they were in breach of the Equality Act of 2010, which said that all children should have equal access to education. And if one in 10 girls were unable to go to school because they couldn't afford a pad or a tampon, clearly that's not equal access. Um, and so eventually, two years later, the government woke up and kind of um, decided that they would start to provide the products in schools, which was brilliant. And that scheme started in, at the beginning of 2020. Um, and when I say it like that, I think it sounds very straightforward. It sounds like a quite simple trajectory. But actually, it was really difficult. And I really struggled a lot of the time um, trying to maintain that optimism and hope that the change eventually would be successful. Um, but I think looking back, the thing that I learned, the biggest lesson I learned across my whole journey with activism was eventually it does and can work. Um, I was 17, I was actually younger than the, vote, the UK voting age when I started free periods. And eventually I was able to convince the government to you know, change government policy and hopefully change the lives of so many young girls in this country. So I believe really passionately that we are, as a generation, in quite a unique position where we have tools and also just the kind of optimism and energy that enables us to come together behind a cause that we feel passionately about and eventually see that through um, to real tangible change. And I think when you look at the world today, I feel kind of terrified at the state of society, not just in the UK, but globally. We're seeing you know, increasing embedded inequality, injustice, um, racism, sexism, and even though it's such a cliche, the planet is literally on fire. And you don't, we're not seeing, I don't think, the right amount, the right responses and the right level of urgency from many governments. So that's where I believe activism is the kind of, it's the gap, it's between us and them. And it's enabling us to kind of rewrite the rules and reshape society in the way that we want it to be. And actually, I, I mean, this sounds again like a cliche, but I think if I can do it, so can you. I, I don't think there's anything particularly unique or special about me that means that I was able to do it. I think we're, we live in a world right now where it's quite, um, it's quite stressful and exhausting to sit around and wait for change to be made. So if you can, if you have an idea, if you feel like there's this burning injustice or there's this change that you believe should be made, then you can be the one to make that change. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us and for giving us that introduction. Um, your particular campaign of Against Period Poverty is something obviously there's a lot of stigma about talking about periods. Um, how did you get over that hurdle and did you find that it was something that sort of haunted you throughout the whole campaign? Definitely, I think 
so I went to a girls' school, a uh, secondary school, and I think also my family, we were very open. So I think I grew up with a slightly false sense of security in that I wasn't massively touched by the period taboo. I obviously knew that it was something that was um, stigmatized in society, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't quite expect the level of um, abuse that I would get just by talking about periods on a public platform. Every time I did any kind of like public or live TV or you know radio interview or whatever, I would have this like barrage of people, usually men, saying, you know, what are you talking about? This is disgusting. Um, you know, I don't want to hear about periods when I'm eating my breakfast or whatever. Um, and I think at first it put me off, but in a lot of ways that was really reinvigorating because I realized that this actually isn't a isolated social issue. This is this the idea the theme of period poverty kind of sits at this intersection of so many different areas of education and health and gender and particularly on that gender point period the period shame and taboo is just another facet of the patriarchy and the fact that for years women's you know women but also every kind of issue relating to women's bodies has been silenced and shamed and it's so um it's so culturally embedded i, I think a lot of people will relate that to that moment when you uh, you kind of slip your tampon up your sleeve or you're like in the toilet and you, you know, like peel off a pad really slowly so it doesn't make a noise. Um, I was actually taught at school that you should slip, that you should put a tampon up your sleeve because God forbid anyone sees a tampon in real life. Um, so I think, I think I, the more I questioned that, the more I felt very, very energized and very kind of um, empowered to try and change that. I realized that it's not that difficult to have a conversation about periods, even though people often blush or get really awkward. You just kind of say the word periods and then that barrier is broken. Um, and so that's what, I, that's what I did and I used it to kind of spur me on. And did you find yourself adapting your campaign in the face of the abuse that you were getting? Um, no, I don't think so. I don't think I adapted it. Um, as I said, if anything, it made me um, more, more um, confident and more willing to like go into graphic detail if I had to, um, maybe just because I wanted to annoy certain people. Um, but I think I, I just learned to expect that level of um, abuse or trolling and ignore it, even though it, it, you know, it's not easy to do that. And you spoke about in your introduction about uh, the transition from an online petition, which probably everybody's very familiar with, to sort of a more um, intense legal um, and political battle. What was that transition like? It was tough. I mean, I think when I started Free Periods, the, very quickly the signatures really came in and it started at, you know, in a couple of weeks it got over a thousand signatures and I was constantly thinking of like everyone I knew, my friends, my friends' parents, my parents' friends, just whoever I could just to get those signatures. And then it, it kind of really took off and snowballed quite quickly. But I think, again, that gave me a sense that because, uh, you know, at the end of 2017, it was 200,000 signatures. And I was like, clearly so many people want to see this change. So why hasn't it happened? And that's when I decided that we needed a change in tack. And that's when I decided to organize the protest. So that felt like a kind of different element of the campaign where we were actually showing up in real life five days before Christmas, um, when there was like a major Brexit debate going on and the you know, House of Commons weren't really thinking about periods, but so many MPs ended up coming from that debate to the, to the protest speaking and you know, loads of amazing celebrities came. And as I said, everyone was wearing red and like chanting about tampons and it was like a really empowering day. And again, even though that got loads of publicity and media attention, the change just didn't come and I had meetings with MPs in the days following that and a lot of them were like yeah we saw the protest and it was great and um, and I was like great so do you think it's gonna happen and they were like unlikely and I was, it was just really frustrating and as I said I, I don't want to give the illusion that any of this work is easy um, because a lot of the time it does feel like you're hitting a brick, brick wall um, and even I think a basic thing that we all grow up hearing is if you have an idea or if you feel empowered to change something, you should email your MP. And I did that about five times and never got a reply. So I think it was very much that feeling of now what do I do, now what do I do? And that's, as you say, that's when I decided that it should transition into a legal campaign. And it was a slightly more 
a sort of robust tactic, I guess, because we we're working with human rights lawyers in London and they felt really strongly also that there was, a le there was legal backing for this change to happen. And I think that's what kind of got the government to do what we wanted because they didn't want to look bad and they didn't want the PR of taking the government, a 17-year-old taking the uh, government to court. So eventually they made the change before we had to go through with the case. And did you have any faith in the government when you started um, campaigning that they would make this change? How did that change as you watched things unfold? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think I always, I always did have faith that it would happen eventually, otherwise I would have given up earlier on. Um, but I think it was, it was particular MPs who really gave me that um, assurance. And also it's a human issue. It's not, I don't think it's something political. It's not a, like a, it doesn't even feel like left wing or right wing. It's very basic. I think that every child should have the right to go to school and poverty shouldn't stand in the way of that. So regardless of political leaning, whoever I spoke to about the campaign, um, MPs or Lords or whatever, they all agreed that it should happen eventually. So I think that's what kept me going. And peer period poverty is obviously a global issue. Um, do you, th what do you think your organization and your accomplishments um, do on a more global stage? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, it's something that I've thought about a lot just because I was really lucky to have the opportunity to travel um, with the campaign and I went to America, I went to Johannesburg and Zambia to um, talk to campaigners and activists who are working against period poverty there and of course, it, <clears throat> excuse me, of course it exists at a very different scale and part of what I think surprised a lot of people to do with free periods when they read about period poverty in the UK was this idea that you know, we have this sense in the UK that we're the fifth largest economy and there's therefore there's no such thing as poverty. And then here you have this issue of girls who are too poor to go to school and it really um, exposed just how deep the level of abject poverty runs in the UK. Um, and so so I think thinking globally, it it's obviously a huge issue and it's obviously only going to be tackled by individual governments. Um, and when Free Periods was eventually successful in this country, that's where I started to think about what our role was globally. And I mean, I feel very passionately, particularly in India, there have been a lot of reports recently of just how, um, how serious the issue of period poverty is there. And the taboo is, I think, very culturally entrenched also. But I personally don't think it's my role as um, a British activist to go and impose my Particularly campaign, particular campaign strategy based on what I learned because I just don't think it works the same in other countries. And also I do believe that there are campaigning groups and activists who are doing incredible work on the ground there. And I, I obviously I'd love to support them and I, and I am in touch with a lot of them and I, you know, we compare notes, but I don't think it's my role to kind of expo expand free periods beyond this country because I, I don't think that would be right. Let's talk about what it was like to run this campaign as a young person and as a woman as well. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that was more of a strength or something that you had to sort of, I suppose, battle through? Yeah, um, I think it was in some it was a strength and a weakness. I think at first, again, I was quite naive in thinking, why wouldn't I be taken seriously? But quite quickly, I did realise I wasn't taken seriously. A lot of the times I would go to meetings in the House of Commons in my school uniform or whatever after school and I would be looked at, um, you know, like I was there on a school trip or something. And then when I would speak, I, I think people, they'd already kind of dismissed me. They already thought they weren't really going to pay attention to what I was saying. Um, and I do think that was often a gendered thing as well. Um, I think I realised quite quickly, though, that I could use that perceived weakness as an advantage because the nature of um, particularly the media I think is that they don't we don't often see young people as politically active in you know for example we can only vote when we're 18 and um, I think we're seeing a change a shift in tone right now where a lot of the media are looking at young activists and thinking oh my gosh this is there's this one teenager who knows something about politics and I think that's that's what happened. So I began to use that a bit as a bit more of a strength, particularly because my campaign was addressing a this kind of school, excuse me, school age issue. So I felt like I could use that um, 
in terms of publicity and talk about my own experience of school and how much harder it would have been if I was suffering through the period of poverty as well. Um, but as I say, I don't, I don't think it should be a generationally divided thing. I think it should, activism is for everyone and should be accessible to anyone who feels passionate enough to make a change. And do you see yourself in formal politics or uh, are there any other campaigns that you're working on now? Um, yeah, I mean, on your first question, I don't think I, at least right, right now, I don't see myself going into formal politics. I think what I said earlier is that I, I don't feel particularly energised or like I feel quite disillusioned with the state of our country right now. And I think there's a lot of distraction um, that personally, I think I, my personality is just, I like to get things done. I like to kind of hone in on one thing and see it, see it through. And that's why I think activism is in a lot of ways, it's different, but it can be more successful than formal politics in terms of tackling specific issues, you know, putting pressure on the government to do a certain thing and then moving on to the next thing. Whereas for me personally, I think that fits with my, my skill set rather than kind of being an MP and um, being across a range of issues. Um, so I don't think it's, it's for me as of right now. <laughs> and in terms of other campaigns moving forward, is there anything that you've, I suppose, got your eye on the next social issue that you think we should all be looking out for? Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I'm not working on anything particular right now. I think I'm really keen to join an existing campaign or initiative. Um, and something that I, I always feel like it's really important to say is that you don't have to start from scratch and create this whole new kind of global campaign or movement. It's that if you feel angry or strongly about a particular issue, it's very unlikely you're the only person in the whole world who's recognised that, that that issue. So there will be something that exists and you can join. And that's kind of what I, I think I want to do in the future, um, as well as talking about activism more broadly and the importance and urgency of campaigning. So you recently wrote um, Make It Happen, um, How to Be an Activist. What was the process like writing a book for the first time and, and sort of trying to distill, I suppose, the knowledge that you've learned in the field? Yeah, um, it was definitely, yeah, my first time writing a book. And I think, so I went to Cambridge and I spent a lot of time writing essays and in a particular tone and style. And I think when I first wrote my first draft of Make It Happen, I handed it in and they were like, change everything <laughs> because it was very academic and like it was it was just the kind of tone that I was used to writing and I think we we're all used to writing it. Um, so they were like, put some feeling in there. So I kind of, I tried to do that. I think my main, um, l like my main hope for the book is that I really wanted to talk about my mistakes. I really wanted to draw on the things that I wish I'd known when I was 17 and I didn't really have a clue what I was doing. I wish I had that book and I had, um, it's just very practical. It's like a toolkit. It's run through everything that I did, but everything I wish I'd known and the things that I wish I'd paid more attention to, the things I did wrong. Um, I also interview about 28 different activists from around the world who have each made changes either on a small scale in their local communities or more broadly, um, there's like global campaigners and celebrities and people who've been huge advocates of huge issues, but also somebody who changed um, the mental health policy in her local GP in Wales. So it's, I think I really wanted to draw attention to the kind of flexibility of activism and the micro to the mi macro. And you're an inspiration to so many young people who want to get involved in politics. What role do you think our generation can play more generally in directing politics in the future? Oh, I think, I think it's very, it's good and bad to talk to um, separate young people as political actors. I think right now, when you look at the House of Commons, particularly, I don't feel particularly represented as a young person, um, and I think that really comes, that's really reflected in terms of the issues that are prioritised. When I talk to my friends about the social issues that they feel strongly about and they want to see change in, it's often, I mean most urgently it's the climate crisis, but also structural racism, gender equality. And these aren't, these aren't things that we're hearing a lot of chat about from the government. So I think they can be sidelined as young people's issues or social media issues or collectivism or whatever. But I think what Free Periods kind of has been a testament to is actually that, that social media, young youth activism as it's always called, is actually 
can be responsible for real tangible change. Um, and that's why I think it's really important that young people aren't put off by the fact that they're not recognised as political actors a lot of the time. I think it's so important that we see that representation, but also that we believe that we're just as, you know, we're just as responsible in making an impact in society than any any other person um, of any age. Um, but then I also I also worry about these generational divides because I think often not only can things be marginalised, but young people can feel marginalised and feel like, oh, that's that's not for me or like I said, kind of waiting for something to be done to you rather than being part of making a change yourself. And there are obviously lots of different ways to protest. We've seen uh, recently more uh, disruptive campaigns like Extinction Rebellion. What kind of activism do you think we should be looking to? Um, I think the most important thing is to see that range. Um, I think protest is becoming, like physical protest is becoming an increasingly visible and important, um, I guess, type of making of making change. And it doesn't always have to be disruptive. The free periods protest was very peaceful, but I think there's a time and a place for all kinds of, all kinds of change making. Um, I think for me, the most important thing was having that, that range within one campaign, because we, as I said, we had an online element, we had a real life element, a legal element, and so much of what I learned is that you can't, you know, I could have never sat down um, in 2017 and said, okay, this is where we're gonna be in 2020. There was no way I was gonna know that. I had to be flexible and changing um, tack every time something went wrong. So that's what I did. And I think that's the most important thing I learned is actually you just, you can't predict how, how it's gonna go and what you have to do next. So. I think having that diversity of, of type is really important within within one campaign, um, and just working it out as you go along in a lot of ways, and also buying the book because it outlines a range of ways. <laughs> and what would you say to the politicians who criticise young activists like Greta Thunberg yourself um, for lacking an understanding about the realities of what the world is and not having the experience they need to take on these big issues? I mean, obviously, I completely disagree. I think so. If you look at someone like Greta Thunberg. I mean, two things. I think firstly, this point has been made before, but certain young people who are heralded as activists, the conversation that often gets missed out is why are we looking, why are we listening to a 13 year old at the UN? Or why are we listening to someone, you know, as young as Malala was when she first started speaking out to, to kind of draw attention to such a huge issue. Um, our society is structured such that, you know, we, we entrust people to make decisions for us. And right now, I think we're, we are, those political, those global leaders are looking at young people to tell them what to do in terms of the climate crisis. And for me, that's incredibly alarming. It's, it's not always inspiring. It's also, you know, you have to question why, um, why it's happening like that. And secondly, I think, again, it's about the generational divides. I think the problem with, looking at and um, individualizing one young person as this kind of archetypal political activist, they, that's a huge responsibility to bear for someone like Greta Thunberg, but it also, um, I think, sidelines the voices of climate activists who are active in a range of communities from all across the world. So I think, um, I mean, obviously I disagree with the fact that you know, you haven't lived enough or you don't have enough experience or you don't have experience in formal politics. I think a lot of the time it is that lack of experience or the d diversity of experience that enables you to make change. I think part of the reason why I started Free Periods was because I was at school and I was able to think, you know, if I missed two days of school for uh, having a flu, whatever, whatever, I'd be so stressed about being getting behind in my A-levels and I started to imagine what it, the reality of period poverty would be like. So I think actually that those range of experiences and the kind of uniqueness of being young is actually something that isn't celebrated enough, particularly right now when we live in the social media age and, you know, the protest, for example, it was entirely organised through social media. Everyone came because they'd seen it on Instagram or Twitter. And so I think we, again, that's something that's not celebrated, the, the power of social media to create movements and communities and actually help achieve change. And do you think that we should be concerned about um, the fact that there are very few people in the House of Parliament under 30. Um, some people think we should lower the voting age. Mm. Is that something that worries you, the lack of young people in formal politics? Or do you think it's almost better that we're coming from the outside? Yeah, I mean, I think 
there's a time and a place for both, but it does worry me that ultimately it is um, the interests of parliament is are the interests of the government and eventually are written out into policy. Um, and I think if we did have more young people in parliament, we'd live in quite a different society. Um, and <laughs> I'm trying to be careful what I say, but I think um, it's really important that also that whereas young people, we are able to imagine ourselves in those roles um, as prime minister or as um, someone in cabinet, because I, you know you've never seen that. Particularly for me as a, like a young woman of colour, I see very few MPs who even look like me. And I think immediately from a young age, that kind of subliminally taught me that. I couldn't be an MP or I wouldn't be successful if I tried to be one. And I think that's a really important point that young people should see what they should believe through seeing. And not everyone can be an activist, not everyone has the time to be a campaigner, but that shouldn't, you should always feel like you have a space and a, and a role in politics. Most recently, you've been very vocal against the police bill. Um, how damaging do you think that will be? Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the most urgent issues right now. And I think, unfortunately, um, it's being clouded over in the media a lot of the time. I think we're talking about, um, you know, Downing Street parties a lot at the expense of talking about um, the fact that a really fundamental de democratic right to protest is essentially becoming um, illegal. I think it's obviously in response to the huge wave, wave, sorry, this huge wave of um, youth activism and climate protests and BLM protests that happened last summer. I think the government have thought, you know, it's best for them to just criminalize protests altogether. And I think that is, it's such a damaging, um, it's so damaging. If you look through history, you see that so much change has been, has been achieved through activism and through physical protests. And, you know, if the the idea that by just by going to a protest or even the new rules are, you know, just by posting about a protest online, you could be given a, a sentence or fined a ridiculous amount. I think it's terrifying. Um, and I think it's just one step to actually something much scarier where the government are actually pushing through, um, you know, other bills that are kind of of the same tone and trying to quash political dissent and portray it as disruptive or, you know, angry or, you know, no their actual wording in the bill is noisy. And if any protest is seen as being too noisy and annoying, it's illegal. But that's literally the point of protest is to be noisy and kind of annoying because you're making a point. Um, so I think it's incredibly damaging and dangerous. And, I, and last um, Friday, I think it was, the House of Lords voted down 14 amendments, which was a positive change and also again, proof that activism and protest does work because all of Saturday there were huge protests all over the country where people were talking about the policing bill um, and then they, they responded rightfully. But there's still some really damaging clauses in there. And you have become in a way a poster girl for youth activism. You've been named Times, uh, one of Time's most influential teens in the 2018 list, a big issue top 100 change, change makers and Teen Vogue's 21 under 21 list. Um, is this something that you've celebrated? What did it feel like to become that person? Um, I think I don't quite believe that I'm that person. <laughs> I don't think that's something that feels particularly natural to my personality. Um, I mean, I think it's great that I was celebrated and to me it's a real, um, again, a real testament to the success of the campaign, which in no, was in no way individual. It was very much a collective effort. It was very much or 200,000 people who signed the petition and the 2,000 people who came to the protests and the lawyers and everyone who supported the legal campaign. It was never just me. Um, but I guess it's the more of the more kind of like youth activism things that I've done, the more I've started to question that. And as I said, I think it's important to be critical of the fact that we do kind of latch on to these individual youth activists um, as either an answer to all of the problems that the government are ignoring, governments are ignoring, or um, it becomes quite dangerous in sidelining other voices. So I've been, yeah, I think I've been wary of that balance and my responsibility as someone with a platform to talk about the things that are important to me, but not be the kind of archetypal activist, because I don't think that exists. And you were awarded an MBE for your work. Um, at the time you were studying history and you said you, you were reluctant to accept it. What changed your mind? Yeah, I mean, I don't think my mind was 
changed. I think I had quite a long process of questioning it and thinking about whether it was what was the right decision for me. Um, when I was when I was offered it, I think the first thing that came to my mind was the fact that the word empire for me conjures up really awful images of, as you mentioned, things that I've studied in history and. I did a whole term studying the British Empire and its impact on India particularly, which is where a lot of my extended family still live, and I felt quite uncomfortable with that association. Um, I think the more I thought about it, the more I felt like I had a responsibility to accept it because of, I was, first of all, I was accepting on behalf of free periods and everyone who supported it, but also I think, I hope that in um, drawing attention to that word empire and my discomfort, I kind of started a conversation and a lot of people disagreed with me, but I, it was a personal decision and it was it was something that I felt comfortable with and I think that's what was important. Um, and I also do think it was just important to have that conversation and be critical of the word and, and talk about why I think it should change. Well, I'm keen to leave some time for audience questions. Um, we'll open it out to anyone in the audience who has a question. If you just raise your hand and we have someone with a microphone. Okay. Uh, yes, the member at the front. Hi. If you uh, just, you. sorry, just stand up and wait for the microphone. Thank you. Um, thanks for the speech, Amica, and the conversation. It was really, really interesting. Um, you mentioned the House of Lords, and I just wondered, um, I mean, it's quite ironic that such an outdated, unrepresentative institution has come to the defense of our very basic civil liberties. Um, do you think in light of that, it's worth, or is it even permissible to kind of drop the fight against such unrepresentative parts of government as that if, if they can actually come to our defense and kind of protect our liberties and act as a ballast against populist governments, or do we need to continue the, sort of the fight to change the system? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and I think that it's a conversation that that, that has been um, overdue and a lot of people are talking obviously about reform to the House of Lords and I think it's quite unusual for them to have stepped in in such a decisive way and prevent the bill from getting any worse than it already was. Um, I personally still think that it should be reformed. I think, I think just the nature of having, um, having an, a scrutinising chamber or a scrutinising body in addition to um, the House of Commons is something that's really valuable, um, but I don't. I don't think it should be structured in the way that it is. I don't think it should be um, hereditary, and I don't think it should be as unrepresentative as it is, as you say. So I think it's a question of reform, or if it was abolished, I think it should be replaced with some form of um, scrutinising body. Uh, yes, the, the member from the Blue Moss. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I just wanted to ask, are there any kind of next steps for you or for free periods um, in the particular fight for that cause that you like envisioned for the next few years? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so in terms of free periods, as I mentioned, um, we, were, we were successful um, in 2019 and then the government scheme started in 2020. Um, and free periods is still ongoing because we're scrutinizing the scheme. and. Unfortunately, there are several issues with it, particularly the fact that every individual at school or college has to opt into the scheme. So they have to actively sign up to, the, to get the products every month. Um, and obviously because it started in 2020 and then it was locked down and schools closed um, and the government had other, other priorities, there just wasn't the right level of awareness and publicity around the scheme. So not many schools actually did know about it. So, the latest statistic that I've received is that over just over 50% of schools in England have actually ordered and received the products, which is just not good enough. I think there needs to be a real push to note for the schools to realise that they are entitled to these free products every month, even if they believe that their students don't need them. I think it's just important that they're available. Um, so that's the next step in terms of free periods. Um, and we're, as you mentioned, still continuing to talk about periods and post about periods and try and um, contribute to breaking that sh uh, shame. I was going to say shaboo, but I meant shame <laughs> and taboo. Um, in terms of me personally, I, so I've just graduated and I'm trying to kind of take a bit of a break now, a bit of a gap year, um, and then hopefully do a master's in the future um, and think about what I want to do next. But I think 
activism and politics will always be part, part of my life, even if it's not leading a new campaign or going into formal politics. And working on the book and publicizing it and making sure that people are reading it and um, starting their own campaigns. And did you find there was a lot of pushback from individual schools once the scheme had been put in place and that maybe yeah. some schools didn't want to order the products for the same reasons that you'd been yeah. dealing with before? Um, I actually haven't found that at all. I think we've received a lot of testimonies from schools who have said that it's making a huge difference and um, a lot of the students who were kind of on their list of repeated absences every month actually are starting to come into school again because of the scheme, which is great. Um, so no, actually we haven't seen any we haven't seen any pushback, which is great. But um, again, I think it's about awareness and schools are just really stretched in terms of all their responsibilities. So we're trying to draw attention to the scheme. And also I should say, we're trying to encourage students and to be activists and to talk to teachers about the scheme and make a big deal about the scheme and actually use it as an opportunity for more education around periods and, um, and the taboo. Yes, I remember in the blue flowery mask and then We'll go to the member in the navy mask afterwards. I'm from Edinburgh and as I'm sure you're aware, in November 2020, Scotland became the first country in the world to provide free period products in all public spaces. And I'm curious to hear what you think about this approach and when you believe the UK government will do the same? Great question. Um, I don't know when it will happen, but I definitely think it needs to. I think it's um, a huge step forward and also by, as Scotland has done it, it proves that it's possible. Um, I think there are a lot of campaigners and activists and charities um, who are working to try and encourage the government to replicate the same approach. But And I'm a huge fan of Monica Lennon, who's the as member of Scottish Parliament and we've kind of been following each other's work and she's always pushed for, for all public spaces and I, it was an approach that I considered when I first started my campaign but when I talked to MPs about it they were like no way <laughs> it's not going to happen so that's why we kind of narrowed in on schools um, but I, I definitely think it should happen and hopefully one day in the future I think if Scot Scotland's proved that it's possible so there's no reason why the government shouldn't follow suit. And the member at the front in the, yeah. Yes, the, yeah, you, no worries. Hi, um, you mentioned you started your project when you were doing your A-levels and then obviously you've just graduated. I was just wondering how you fit in activism around your studies and what motivated you to keep balancing the two things and how you approached all of that. Yeah, um, it was really difficult, <laughs> I'll be honest. Um, I think when I, was, when I was doing my A-levels, I was obviously at school all day and had to kind of cram it into the evenings. And I was really lucky that my school was very supportive of the campaign and um, were quite flexible with when I had to like miss some school or go to a different country or something like that. Um, but I think it, it, I found it really difficult because obviously at university you have a huge amount of work and this was like a full-time career and um, often the people that I was working with or talking to they were doing it as a full-time career so it was quite difficult to explain that I couldn't have that same level of commitment all the time um, but I think I think it's for me it's just made me realize that it's if it's possible to do it if you feel strongly enough to do it and you you can, then you should. Um, but also, as I said, it doesn't have to be all in. It doesn't have to be completely consuming um, or as kind of large scale as free periods was. You can just join something that already exists, an existing campaign or um, protest or movement or social media group or volunteer with a charity. And that's something that I think is really doable. I think the idea of activism is really changing now because we don't, I think when I was younger, if the word activist would have made me think of someone like, really radical kind of chilled chilled chained to like a railing or like you know you know someone that does it as a full-time career and that's all they live and breathe but actually social media is partly responsible for the idea that we can we can just dip our feet into these things and get involved from from a, our own perspectives but not in an all-consuming way it can be um on the weekend or after uni or you know whatever um and also that activism can be part of uni you can protests for change within the institutions that you're already part of. Um, so just go to the member that's next to you and then the one behind. 
Um, yeah, I was wondering if you had any more um, recommendations for further reading or literature that you found um, interesting or inspiring or to sort of, yeah, look further into in this Yeah, Yeah, um, it's a very Oxford question. <laughs> um, yes, I'm trying to think. I mean, actually, a lot of the contributors um, that I spoke to who have published similar books, Sophie Walker, who was the leader of the Women's Equality Party, published a book um, called Five Rules for the Rebellion, which is all about um, protest and activism. Um, Kajal Dedra, who um, is from Change.org, has published a book similar as well. Um, I think I personally take a lot of inspiration from people working on specific issues. Um, for example, Natives by Akala, I think taught me a lot of what I know about um, empire and history and really fed into my thinking around those issues. And I always recommend that one. Um, also social media accounts. I think I follow a lot of activists who I often like disagree with or um, are part of different initiatives or different areas of activism. And that really helps me to kind of like expand my thoughts. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples. Um, I guess, yeah, I guess, I mean, my book has a lot, a lot of um, different, <laughs> different examples and different activists who I would really recommend. Um, I just thought of one. I think um, an, a book that I actually have always, I came back, I read a few years ago and then I came back to in the pandemic. Um, it's called Hope in the Dark by Rebecca Solnit. And she wrote it, I think, around 2013, but then it was republished um, in 2019. And it was so, it, it was just the most timely book for the pandemic and lockdown because it's all about how in when society looks really gloomy and scary and um, things feel really bleak. It was kind of about changing your mindset to extract hope from from that um, despair. And I think that's what a lot of people needed during COVID, but also it's just really important in all activism to kind of maintain optimism and hope. Um, and the member just behind. Um, so you talked a little bit about your interest in um, or concern for the climate crisis at the moment. Um, and I was wondering if you had any ideas on making sanitary products more sustainable um, in the future. Yeah. Um, so it was a question that I got asked about a lot when I was um, when free periods were still campaigning, because a lot of people said moon cups, for example, are far more um, environmentally friendly. So surely everyone should just, just get a moon cup. Um, and I think I completely agree. And I think that will be the reality in the future. But I think in terms of where free periods sat at kind of school, aiming at school aged children, some of the um, girls who would contact me were as young as 11 and say they were suffering through period poverty. I don't think I was comfortable enough with my body to use a moon cup, for example, um, at the age of 11. Um, and I don't think it's for everyone, but I do think we are seeing a kind of cultural shift right now where more people are talking about sustainable products and they feel they feel, feel slightly more mainstream. I think when I first started Free Periods, I didn't really know what a moon cup was. I didn't really know what um, disposable, um, sorry, reusable pads were, but now they feel far more talked about and a lot of my friends use them. And I think that's a really positive sign that we are heading in the right direction. But I do think, um, it's different for um, for the campaigning side. Uh, Disha. Oh. Um, one of the things you talked about is that feeling that you've kind of hit a brick wall um, when you were managing your campaign. Um, how did you kind of motivate yourself to keep going when um, a lot of the times you might have felt like the people in power weren't listening to what you had to say because you know you're a, you're a young person. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was, def I mean, it was definitely something I found really difficult. Um, I guess a lot of the time I would come back to the initial reasons why I started Free Periods and I would come back to particularly the petition where when I first started, a lot of the comments were people who had suffered in, through period poverty. Either in the past, I would get kind of um, slightly older women saying, you know, I faced this 30 years ago when I was at school. I didn't realize it was still an issue. Or it was people saying, this is me and I'm still struggling through, through through period poverty and I would also be contacted by them and actually you know formed friendships with some of the girls who had contacted me and said that this is making a real difference even just conversationally so I think it was coming back to that that's what motivated me when it when it felt bleak and it felt like I was hitting a brick wall 
but also just the people who were supporting and the people who were constantly signing the petition, following us on social media, getting in touch and ask, you know, I got young people as young as like 13 years old saying, I've signed the petition, I've donated to a charity, I'm volunteering with, um, you know, I'm distributing products at schools. I've sent it to all my friends and my parents and everyone, what more can I do? And I would just be completely amazed by that level of commitment. So I, I didn't consider giving up. We have time for one or two more questions. Yes. Okay. In the, in the... Um, thank you so much. I was just wondering why you were campaigning. Did, did you feel like you were campaigning more as a kind of feminist movement or a human rights movement and how much kind of support from men either in the public or in parliament did you feel that you got yeah um well i don't think they have to be mutually exclusive in terms of feminism and human rights because i think often they do overlap a lot um, i definitely felt like i was and still feel like i'm part of a feminist movement and i guess some of the conversations i had around that you just made me feel more passionately about how important feminism is and how much we sideline it as something that men aren't part of or as um, I think part of the conversation that I meant to talk about earlier when I was talking about challenges is that quite early on in the campaign I was contacted by a lot of um, trans boys and non-binary people who said that they felt excluded from the campaign because the messaging was very much around schoolgirls, um, but they do have periods too and I immediately changed you know I, it led me to change my the wording of the campaign and obviously I received a lot of hate for that a lot of people were confused and I think in within the feminist movement what's to me really troubling is those conversations around language and around um the the kind of inclusive what I see as inclusivity becomes really damaging and prevents us from being united and moving forward because often I mean what I found is that by in being inclusive, I didn't lose out on anything. I wasn't, I, I was still including the people who were initially part of it. I was just including people who deserve to be. Um, and so I think it, it's, it's really upsetting, I think, when you, we stumble on those small hurdles and get distracted from the broader goal. And I also felt like it was really important to draw attention to the feminist slant of the campaign also because so often in the press or in public discourse, words like feminism or, um, misogyny or sexism they get they sound really um extreme or radical and actually they're to me they're really simplistic and um and obvious how desperately we need them and what, how important they are so i was always kind of very um willing to use that language because i, I felt like free periods was undoubtedly a feminist campaign i think we have time for our final question so okay. i'll finish with the question that we've asked all of our speakers this term. Yes. If there's one thing that you could um, tell our members to have them go away and think about this week, what would that be? Ah, um, I think the main, my main piece of advice would be to do something. I think it's, it can be, as I said, really scary and disillusioning to, like, to look at the state of the world today and feel a sense of despair or um, just pessimism about what the future might be like. But I think we've been told a lie that actually we, as citizens, we don't have political power, we don't have the power to shape, shape society. And actually, I think that's where activism comes in. That's, where, that's what campaigning is. It's about recognizing the need for something and contributing to making it happen. That wasn't intentional. Um, but I think it's really important that we all, we all feel, um, not just by looking at activists and campaigners, but just looking at the world today, I, I think there's plenty of evidence to prove that campaigning does work and we have much more power than we're led to believe and small changes in communities within universities if you know if you see something that doesn't feel right that doesn't sit right with you why shouldn't you be the person who tries to change it um so i would say i mean even if it's small i think if you can think of one thing that you want to change you should well amica thank you so much it's been a thank pleasure you. to host you Please do join us um, on Wednesday for our Holocaust Memorial Panel and uh, in the chamber here for our capitalism debate on Thursday. And join me in thanking Amica for her time.